Welcome everybody. How are you? Good. <laughs> Yay. Thank you, Colette. Got to have a friend in the audience. So uh, at least two. I, got, I think I got two somewhere. So I'm really excited to be here back on stage. Uh, loved my time with Jeff, loved my time at LinkedIn, and I'm glad you guys have a taste or an insight on what it's like to be working with Jeff. So I'm excited to announce this year's most in-demand employer rankings. Very, very important. Talent brand is essential to every company. It sets the stage for who you are, who you aspire to be, and people can smell if it's authentic. They know it. They see it in your profile, they see it in how you post online, um, it's really, really relevant. People are researching. So my, my opportunity, your opportunity, is really focus on your employer brand. So this influences who you hire, who you get to hire, your acceptance rate. There are billions and billions of interactions between members and companies. And this actually informs who are our top companies. So without further ado, let me announce here are the most 100 sought after employers. So check out your brand. There's 24 new brands on the 100 list this year. Yahoo came back online into the top 100, so good for Yahoo to come back. I'm an ex-Yahoo. Uh, woo, come on, Yahoos. Be, be, have some pride. And then Lego showed up. So my family, I have three kids, Lego. I think Lego rocks. So these are the top. Let me go into the top five. So first, I have to do it again. Facebook, Microsoft, Woo! Unilever, Apple, amazing. And last but not least, second year in a row, Google. <laughs> Woo! So, Ladslow has some amazing secrets he's going to share. So, I'm really excited that following the most in demand employer out there, Laszlo's going to talk about some of the secrets. He'll share what, what's the traits, what does he do, how does he make the brand relevant and real and authentic within Google. So, without further ado, let me welcome Laszlo. Hey, how's everyone doing? Okay, nice to catch you right after the break, but not too close to lunch. Uh, so thanks for having me here. Um, I actually want to call out, um, there's a couple of my colleagues here. Are there some Google folks in the room? Because I want Google folks, there's one. Anyone else? Stand up. The only reason I'm doing this is because I want you guys to keep me honest. So we do this thing at Google every Friday called TGIF, where the founders stand up, our CEO Larry Page, you can ask him anything. And if he's BSing, you can also stand up and say, like, I don't think that's correct. And so Google people, keep me honest. Um, it's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful to be here. LinkedIn is a fantastic tool. I use it all the time. Our teams use it. It is revolutionary. So it's great to be part of this conversation. Uh, I'm going to get my one-year badge today, and maybe someday I'll get my five-year badge. So I was asked to come and talk, and I tried to figure out what would be the most interesting thing to talk about to a room that is 90% talent acquisition professionals, and I figured, well, obviously, recruiting. But the problem is when you talk about recruiting, a lot of it isn't super exciting. It's kind of like we post a job, we screen candidates, we interview them, and at the superficial level, it's not that compelling. So I want to dig a little more deeply into how we do things at Google, and I want to introduce you to the single best recruiter at Google and in Google's history. Now, recruiting's always been core to what we do. We now get over 3 million applications every single year. And we hire about 700 people. So what that means is one out of every 428 people who apply ends up working at Google. So for context, that's about 20 times more selective than a place like Harvard or Stanford or Yale or Princeton or what have you, right? So we spend a lot of time thinking about how do you find people and how do you filter them? Because some of our best candidates don't actually come from the applications. We have to go out and find them. And we've been doing this for a long time. So I thought the most interesting thing would be to tell you a little bit about how we do this. And you know, we'll be putting more of this information out over time and writing about it and so on. But I wanted to share with you before anybody else kind of what we're up to. So let's look at where we started. So most of you, when you're recruiting, the fundamental question is, how do you get this candidate who you believe is perfect for your company to take a risk? 
Because the best people have good jobs, they're comfortable, they're well paid, they're being rewarded, and they need to roll the dice and join an entirely new company working for a brand new manager, and that is a risk. And you look at Google today, and Google doesn't seem so risky. But 10 years ago, even five years ago, Google was viewed as way more risky. The company I worked at before Google was General Electric. And I remember on my last week at General Electric, the CEO of my division took me aside, and he was wonderful and gracious and invested in me. And he said, Laszlo, this Google thing is cute, <laughs> but I don't really think it's going anywhere. And when you're ready for a real company again, we'll hold a job for you. You're welcome back anytime. And it was a very generous offer. I mean, the company was very, it was viewed as risky. Everyone was taking pay cuts to join. You weren't sure what was going to happen. And this is how people thought of Google. So we were in the same shoes that many companies, startups in particular, are in today. And the original challenge was just how do you find people? And you can see this is a chart showing how many people we've hired every single year, our total headcount, rather. Um, and you can see each year it's gone up again and again and again by a huge amount. We now have over 55,000 employees. But we weren't always sophisticated in figuring out how to find them. This is how we used to track our hiring. <laughs> this probably looks familiar to a lot of people. You probably have your own version. We had two rooms filled wall to wall with whiteboards, and we would put little dots on them every time we did offers. So what you see here on the bottom, those are the years from late 99 to 2001. Each dot is a time we made a round of offers. The exclamation point is every time we doubled the size of the company. And what's crazy is on the bottom, you can just barely make out, it says, you know, weekly Noogler inflow rate. Nooglers are new Googlers. Get it? Noogler. Um, we were hiring at the time. So when, when I took this photo, it was much later, and we were hiring 31 people a week. And now we have weeks where we hire over 300 people. And we thought we had a big problem on our hands. But hiring took six to nine months. Candidates had to go through 15 to 25 interviews. It was an awful candidate experience, and we needed to fix it. Um, but there were some things that from the very beginning, because of the DNA that Larry and Sergey laid down and the insights they had that made a huge difference. Because the company, even in their early history, found exceptional, exceptional people. And this predates me. This, I had nothing to do with this. I was a beneficiary of it. Everyone in the company was focused on recruiting. Our top executives would spend one full day a week or more interviewing, assessing candidates, sourcing candidates, recruiting candidates. These are our top executives, right? We had a guy, Jonathan Rosenberg, who was our head of product uh, for a decade. And the way he would recruit is when he'd have a candidate on the fence, he'd print out a stack of resumes at random from the company, 100, 200 resumes, and he'd show it to prospective candidates and say, you get to work with these people. And people would flip through and be impressed enough that they would come join. So we always, always spent time on this. And if you interview the first 100 Googlers and ask them, which we've done, and ask them, what are the secrets to Google's success? In their top two reasons, one of them is always, we did a great job hiring people. So how did we do this? Number one, set an incredibly high bar for talent and quality, and never, ever, ever compromise. So Larry and Sergey had this insight very early on that when you're hiring, what happens over time is there's reversion to the mean. So if you're a founder, if you're a recruiter, if you're a hiring manager, you know exactly what you want, and you have an incredibly high bar. But then you hire that person, and they have a pretty good idea of what you want. And they'll hire someone who's almost as good as them. And then that person will hire somebody who's almost as good as them. And over time, what happens is you're just hiring average people. And that's why performance distributions look the way they do in companies, because on average, we are average at hiring. And what Larry and Sergey realized is early on, you have to draw a line and say, hiring managers are eventually going to be biased, because they want to fill a job as fast as they can. And there's going to be pressure in the company to hire people that you probably shouldn't hire. Nephews and cousins and college roommates, the, the daughter of an important client, right? Why not give that one person a job? And the problem is, as soon as you start compromising, everyone else in the company sees that, oh, OK, this is how it works. It's just politics, and let's get anyone I can a job, instead of holding a consistently, consistently high bar. So this is how we did it. Can anyone guess what's special about this photo? Go ahead and just shout out anything special you see in here. It's a pretty boring photo. Marissa Mayer. That is Marissa Mayer. Uh, that's good. That is special. It is not the most special thing. What else? <laughs> Nothing. What's that? Ping pong table. Yes. The ping pong table 
is actually the most special thing in this room. Because what we started doing from the earliest days is we did not let managers make hiring decisions. When the company was 20 people, 50 people, 200 people, 500 people, we would sit around these ping pong tables, this one ping pong table, and a committee of people who have nothing to do with that candidate would make a decision whether or not to hire. We took power away from managers because it was important to be objective and make an unbiased decision about who you could hire. And that happened around that ping pong table. That was the key to not compromising. So the first thing is, I'd urge you in your organizations, set a high standard, which I know you do, and hold your clients to it and never, ever, ever compromise. It's better to grow more slowly and have higher quality people. That's rule one. But then you have a problem is, how do you assess the people? Because the hiring committee is no longer interviewing everybody. So now you're getting feedback from people who interviewed. You're getting notes or conversations. And you need to figure out, are we interviewing people well? And do we know if these people are actually going to perform well? And are our interviews reliable? Because remember, on average, we're average at assessment. So there's fascinating, fascinating research that shows, even with the best of intentions, our brains conspire to cause us to make bad hiring decisions. There's a study that was done in 2004 that's had uh, sent out two sets of identical resumes to companies in Chicago and Boston. One set had names that sounded traditionally white, Sam, Sally, you know, Fred, things like that. The other set had names that sounded stereotypically African American. So Tamika, Jamal, names like that. And what they found was that you had to send out 50% more resumes if you had an African American sounding name, but an identical background than if you had a white sounding name. And the thing is, there's not a lot of people who are overtly racist screening resumes going, oh, you know, I don't like this person's name. But we subconsciously and unconsciously make these inferences about people's capabilities, and they're almost always wrong. And as a result, we hire the wrong people, or we fail to hire the best people. And we're not aware of it. This is where the whole theory of unconscious bias that we've been working on for the last few years at Google comes from. The idea that there's things that happen in your brain that you don't know about. But when you tell people, the research shows you don't have to win their hearts and minds. They actually go, oh, I didn't realize I had a bias. I'm not going to look at the names as closely. I'm instead going to look at the accomplishments. So science can really help you assess candidates. But I want to give you another example. Uh, Trisha Prickett and Frank Bernieri at the University of Toledo did a study where they had trained interviewers, so people just like any of us. They know how to interview. They know how to assess people. And they had these trained interviews interview candidates. And they recorded the interviews, 20 to 30 minute interviews. Then they turned off the sound, and they showed those same interviews to what they called naive observers, uh, which in layman's terms means college sophomores. <laughs> and they said, they said, take a look at this interview, and can you predict whether or not the person got hired? And so they showed a 30-minute interview, then a 20-minute, and less and less and less. Can anyone guess how much time a naive observer needs to be able to make the same assessment as a trained professional? Three minutes, 30 seconds. What else? Five minutes. Five minutes? What, what did you say? Five. Five minutes? It's even more depressing than that. Ten seconds. Ten seconds. And here's what happens in an interview in 10 seconds, right? You're seated. Oh, hi, I'm Laszlo Bach. Nice to meet you, too. Oh, yeah, you know, the train was late, and, but I was able to deal with it. I stopped at Starbucks, and everything worked out fine. So, you know, what can I tell you? That's it. That was enough for somebody watching this to be able to say not just would the trained interviewers recommend hiring this person, but also with a high degree of correlation to be able to identify whether the trained interview discovered that this person was ambitious, competent, confident, employable, expressive, intelligent, likable, nervous, polite, trustworthy, warm. They were able to discern all these things to the same level of sophistication and accuracy as somebody who spent 30 minutes interviewing them, which is super depressing, right? Like what it tells you is most of the time we spend interviewing is what is responding to what they call thin slices, these thin slices of interaction and then we spend the rest of the interview, without realizing we do this, trying to confirm or deny that hypothesis we make in that first 10 seconds. Oh, he, Laszlo takes the same train I do. What a good guy. Oh, nice firm handshake. By the way, he looks like me. Wow, maybe we went to the same school. We have so much in common. This is a guy who's going to be fantastic. We all make these snap judgments if we're not aware of it. 
And the research shows that all it takes is a few seconds. So interviews themselves are not typically very reliable. And if you look at what happens, very few companies actually look at the inter initial interview assessment and then goes back and tracks what happens to performance over time and do the interviews actually predict performance. We do some of this. We see a mild to strong correlation. It depends on the job a little bit. But it makes sense to actually look at what happened and go back. And none of us ever do. And as interviewers, most people don't go back and say, oh, yeah, I thought that person was awesome. Um, we all make these mistakes. So how do you fix it? Fortunately, there's been over 100 years of research on selection. And I shared this with a friend of mine a while ago. And he said, this stuff's really boring. Like, nobody's going to want to hear this stuff because it's process and it's bu buzzwords. And, and I said, the framework is not the most compelling thing in the world. I'm going to tell you right now. Like, it's not, you know, you're not going to look at, like, the little yellow Android and go, oh, my god, that's the best image I've ever seen. Um, but the results you get make a difference. And we have evidence that says it actually helps Google hire dramatically better and helps people perform better, and helps candidates feel that they were assessed more objectively and that the process was more fair, to the extent that now almost 90% of people who we interview and reject will tell us that I would still recommend somebody to come work at Google. Right? Like These are the people we said no to, and they still are referring candidates into us. Right? It's amazing. So number one, how do you solve this problem of bias and assessment and so on in the interview process? Number one is have very clear criteria up front. And this is not the garbage that goes in the job description, right? Job descriptions, there's legal restrictions around what you can put. They're not great assessment things. A lot of them are generic. Have clear criteria. And at Google, we have four criteria for every job. Number one, general cognitive ability. This is not test scores. It's not a GPA. It's not brain teasers. I hate brain teasers. Manhole covers and how many golf balls can you fit in an airplane. There's no evidence to suggest at any company that that actually predicts performance. And by the way, some of our some of our interviewers still ask those questions. I'm sorry. We're trying to make them stop. <laughs> but the reason we ask about general cognitive ability, because again, the science shows that the number one best predictor of job performance is a job test, where you actually have someone do the job. Well, for most of the jobs we all recruit for, that would take a lot of time and effort, and, and we couldn't do it, and the jobs are ambiguous anyway. But equally good is general cognitive ability. How well can someone solve problems? How curious are they? And, and how fast are they at picking new things up? So we ask about that because we know it's highly predictive. Second thing we ask about is leadership. Everyone says, yeah, OK, we ask about leadership too. I don't care if you were vice president of the chess club or if you were president of this or that other club in college. I don't care what your title was at your current company, because titles are different all over the place. And I don't even care if you've ever managed people. What we at Google care about is what we call emergent leadership. So the notion here is we want somebody who's not going to step forward and say, I'm in charge now. I'm going to run the show. We want somebody who, when they see a problem, when they're a member of a team, and they see that problem, they step in, they help solve that problem. But just as importantly, once the problem is resolved, they step back out. They're willing to relinquish power. And there's all kinds of things in our culture where we, we actually take power away from people. right? The idea that a hiring manager can't make a hiring decision is one of those examples. Because we want people to be able to give up power and let someone else take charge of the team and let someone else lead when that person is a better leader. Because it's situational. You're not going to be the best leader for every situation. The third thing is Googliness. So everyone at Google will give you a different definition of what it means. Um, I will tell you what it is not. It's not, are you a programmer? It's not, are you just like us? It's not, do you fit a certain narrow mode, mold? It's, when you boil it all down, are you comfortable with ambiguity? Because we have a very ambiguous environment. We're doing all kinds of crazy things. Do you have intellectual humility? Not humility per se. We have people with very healthy egos, just like every company does. But intellectual humility means you're able to say, I was wrong when presented with new data and change your position. That's what we look for. And then the final element of that is we look for people who will bring something new to our mix. The tech industry has a real problem. There's a lot of homogeneity of thought and of representation. And that ends up hurting your users. And it's actually also kind of like not good for the world. It's kind of evil. And so we look for people who will bring something new and different to our organization. Um, the final and least important thing is role-related expertise. Do you actually have the skills and knowledge to do the job we are hiring you for? Because our theory of the case is, if you have these other three attributes, you'll figure out the rest. And 
you are likely to come up with a new solution that nobody else has ever seen. Because if all you do is hire people who've been doing the same thing again and again and again, it's like Abraham Maslow says, right? The, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem begins to resemble a nail. We don't want people to apply the same solution again and again and again. We want something new. And so this is what we look for. And even in engineering, we expect a very high level of engineering expertise, but we prefer to hire generalists, not people who are deeply, deeply, deeply specialized. So number one in terms of what you do to solve this assessment problem is have clear criteria up front in terms of what you look for. Number two, define what good, bad, and mediocre interview results look like. Again, this is like old science, but we require it. And we're rolling out a tool internally that actually will make this happen for every single one of our interviews. Um, but basically, there should be s clear standards. And the reason you do that is because some people are good interviewers and some are bad. Some are easy graders and some are tough graders. And when you get back to this making this hiring decision, you want it to be objective. And you don't want just to hire a bunch of people because Laszlo happens to be an easy grader who just loves people and everyone looks wonderful to me, right? Uh, I should disclose I do not love people <laughs> at all. Um, so once we have these criteria, we also make sure we're assessing people correctly using the right kinds of interview questions. So we use something called structured interviews. Show of hands, does that, who's heard of structured interviews? OK, good. This will make this section go a lot faster. Um, structured interviews are where you have a consistent set of questions. They don't have to be identical, but every candidate gets a similar set of questions. So when we're assessing general cognitive ability, you know, we have a bank of hundreds of questions we ask. And by the way, there's, if you search online for structured interviews, and I won't it's not my place to tell you which search engine to use if you're going to do that. <laughs> but, but if you do, you will find all kinds of samples. So you don't have to write your own. But there's two kinds. And they're characterized by having consistent questions and clear criteria to assess the, set, the quality of responses. Uh, type one of, of interview questions that we ask, situational. <laughs> In my defense, it's really hard to come up with a graphic for the concept of situational. So. Uh, for those who don't know, Mike the Situation Sorrentino from the Jersey Shore. Um, you know, um, so situational questions are hypothetical questions where you present a job-related hypothetical. So if you're hiring a recruiter, you might ask, you're recruiting a candidate who's in the middle of a divorce, but you really want to get this person to move, and how would you convince her to move? Right? Another situational one might be um, you have a candidate who you know, is kind of lukewarm on their company, but they love their boss. And this is their dream situation, and their bosses, they've been together for 10 years, and they're trying to, they, they can't leave this person. There's just a loyalty issue. And then you ask a series of questions. You know, here's the situation. What would you do? Why did you do that? What else would you do? Why, did you, why would you take those other actions? So you alternate between sort of these what and why questions. And it's that simple, and you get better interview assessment. The other kind, there's situational structure questions, and then there's what kind? <laughs> Behavioral. OK, I promise these are the last slides like this. Um, so behavioral ones are where you ask a candidate to describe a prior achievement and relate it to what's required in the job. Now, these are cool because one of the ways we assess cognitive ability is we'll ask somebody, give me an example of an incredibly difficult problem you solved. And if they say, well, I got my left shoe on my left foot, you know, you know that's probably not a candidate you want to hire. But if they say, you know, they invented cold fusion, you say, oh, that's interesting. Tell me more. And it gives you a sense, without the noise of case interviews, which are coachable and all these ridiculous brain teasers and things like that, of what that candidate considers challenging or exemplifying that attribute and how to relate it directly back to the job. So these are the kinds of questions we ask every single candidate. But all of this is enabling. This is a means to an end. It helps the person who's our best recruiter make sure he's actually finding and talking to the best people. But I promised to introduce you to the best recruiter, and I want to answer the question of how does he actually convince them to join the company? So it comes down to meaning. <clears throat> our best recruiter realizes that all of us want our work to mean something. Work for most people is a pretty mediocre experience, and it doesn't have to be. And he finds a way to connect that thirst, that desire for meaning, with every individual he talks to. So this is our best recruiter. This is Alan Eustace. He's our senior vice president of engineering. He's been with the company for over a decade. All the science and rigor we have helps him. But if you get a call from him, you may as well give your two weeks notice, because you, you are going to join Google. He's recruited hundreds of people. Um, he's gone head to head with some ferocious talent competitors and convinced people to come to Google. And 
This is his pitch, if you'll indulge me in a quick video. If you could play the clip, please. I see the walls, then see them fall. You break through them all. We want to create technology to dramatically improve the world. To really transform our urban centers. To preserve and promote culture online. To study and be inspired by science. I'm currently combining medical research and computer science to improve breast cancer diagnostics. That next generation of smart, powerful women, they're already knocking on the door. A station, this is Google Plus. How do you hear me? So Ichi, hear you loud and clear, how me? We try to push these challenging technologies to transform the world and change people's lives. Now we're in uncharted waters, and what I'm talking about has never really been done before. But that's why we should do it. That's what he sells. That's what people sign up for, and that's what he connects their jobs to. And it doesn't matter if you're a frontline person doing uh, support for advertisers, or whether you're somebody in people operations, or whether you're an engineer building this kind of stuff. And now a common critique I hear when we talk about the kind of stuff we do as a company is, well, you're Google. Of course you can do it. You're doing, you've got self-driving cars and contact lenses that can identify your blood sugar so that diabetics can benefit. You're doing all these crazy things, and you have these nice profit margins that you can afford to. But it's not just a Google thing, this connection to a mission. So the Brandix Group is a Sri Lankan textile company. And their chief people officer told me that their goal is inspiring a large female workforce by telling employees to come as you are and harness your full potential. So they give pregnant women supplemental food and medicine, which in Sri Lanka is a huge deal, and in India and Bangladesh where they have operations. They train workers to be entrepreneurs, because the idea is this is a transition, right? Like Reed was talking about. You're not going to be here for life necessarily but we want to promise you a better life. They, in their communities, they have a program called Water and Women where for the women who work for them, they will build wells in their villages, giving people free access to water that's healthy and, and pathogen free. And they do it because they want to be a different company. They don't see their goal as manufacturing textiles, even though they're the second biggest Sri Lankan company. They see themselves as a company that is focused on lifting women out of poverty and making their villages and children healthier. And that's a textile company that is an outsourced manufacturer for other companies. There's an example closer to home, too. There's a company called Russ and Daughters. It's a deli in New York City. There's a guy working there named Chapta Sherpa Pinasha. And there was a New York Times article where he was interviewed a year ago. He's worked there for the last 10 years, and his entire job is to slice smoked salmon. That's all he does. He cuts locks for a living. And before that, his background is he was born in a village in the eastern Himalayas where he lived in a wooden shack. He was the youngest of four children. And at 15, he started working. And his job was carrying 90-pound bags of provisions to base camp for Mount Everest climbers, right? And then he ends up in the United States, and his job is slicing fish. And somebody asked him, the New York Times journalist asked him, like, you know, how could you make this transition? Like, you're helping people achieve their lives' dreams. You're helping them, like, climb Mount Everest. You're saving their lives sometimes. Now you're in a deli behind a counter. All you do is this all day. And he said, the two jobs are not really different. Both involve helping people. And so the connection back to Google and the way we think about recruiting and to Alan is that our challenge as recruiters and managers is to draw that same connection between the jobs we have and the people we want to hire. We want every single job to be a calling. And it can be done in textile mills. It can be done if you work in a deli. It can be done at Google. It can be done at your companies. 
But if you still don't believe me, Amy Rosensky, who's a professor at Yale, did this fascinating piece of work where she asked people to describe their jobs. Is it a job? It's just something I do. Is it a career, something I'm going to win at or advance at? Or is it a calling, a source of enjoyment, a source of fulfillment? I'm doing useful work for the world. And what she found in every profession she looked at, nursing and doctors, teachers, librarians, engineers, analysts, even, even cleaning staff, she found that a third of the people thought of their jobs as callings. So it's possible. What she did when, it's, when she went into a hospital and she talked to the janitorial staff, a third of the janitorial staff there said, you know what, I work in a coma ward. And these people are totally non-responsive, but I clean the floor, I throw out the garbage, and then I move the paintings around on the walls. And Amy said, why, why would you do that? You could get fired for that. And this particular person said, because I think in some small way, providing a little extra stimulation for them visually might help them recover. This person chooses to see their job as a calling. Doesn't have to. No one told her to do it. But she does it because that's how we see, she sees her job. But it's more than that. There's actually a business benefit to having people see their work as a calling, as a mission as well. So Adam Grant uh, wrote a book called Give and Take. He's a professor at Wharton. And he went to call centers. And he said, um, he asked the question. These were call centers where they were raising money to, uh, for financial aid for college students. And he, being a researcher, set up control groups. And in control group A, the average group was raising $1,300 a week. This is just dialing for dollars, right? You know, how much money, you know, do you want to give to your college? Do you want to give to your college? But he said, what if you connected these people who are dialing for dollars with the beneficiaries of their work? So he asked scholarship recipients to write a short essay that said, here's what I learned in college. The scholarship made it possible for me to learn, you know, about Shakespeare. It made it possible for me to get a job that paid more money. There was zero effect. Zero effect in terms of productivity. But then he said, what if we gave them a uh, an essay about how this scholarship changed their lives? You open new vistas for me. I have completely different opportunities. I didn't know how the world worked. I didn't meet people as diverse as this until I went to college thanks to the money you raised. What do you think happened? Obviously, it went up, right? Front row nodding very slowly. Yeah, they, they're all trick questions at this point. It went from $1,300 a week to $3,000 a week. $3,000 a week, a huge increase. And then he said, well, what if we actually could get them to meet the recipients who are the beneficiaries of their work? So we had people come in and spend just five minutes talking to the people in this call center, five minutes. And the result was a 400% increase in how much was raised. So control group, $1,300 a week. Group D, where they actually met the recipients for five minutes a month, $5,000 per week. So this connection to the business, connection to the mission, connection to where you're going and, and broader humanity is incredibly important because we all want meaning in our work. And that in many ways is what Alan pitches and what Google tries to offer, a platform to create jobs for businesses, solve traffic deaths, stop diabetes, bring freedom of information to the world, touch billions of people. That is the promise. And it's something that each of you can find a way to offer to in your jobs, because that is what all of us want. So what are the secrets? Never, ever, 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 say it with me, ever, ever compromise on quality, because it's toxic. And people see poor performers, and it tells everyone in the organization that it's OK to compromise, and it's OK to have people who are mediocre performers, and I don't need to work that hard, and your very best people will leave. And the very best people won't want to join. Never compromise on quality by taking power away from your managers and having a different group, a hiring committee, or in our case, even Larry Page. He, to this day, reviews every offer we make. Have somebody else make that decision. Number two, use science. Use structured interviews. You don't have to use those photos but use structured interviews, have clear criteria, make sure your managers interview this way. And if they don't interview, throw out their feedback. It's what I do. I throw out feedback every week from people and say, like, you know, this interview was worthless because it wasn't structured, therefore it could be biased, and it's not calibrated with what we're looking for. And I tell that hiring manager or that interviewer, you need to do a better job. And then third, give candidates a reason to join. We all want, we're all human. We all want similar things in life. We want meaning. We want to be happy. We want freedom from want. And drawing that connection between the meaning that you each see in your jobs, because you're out there selling those companies every single day, drawing that connection for every candidate is incredibly 
incredibly important. And that is the secret for how we recruit at Google, how Alan recruits. And I should mention, just in closing, one, one other thing. We, we are hiring. <laughs> so thank you, everybody.